with breaking news. Angry crowds growing as we work to figure out why El Cajon police were forced to shoot a black man in this parking lot. Team 10 has coverage of the volatile situation that is unfolding right now. We begin tonight with 10 News reporter Emily Fode. Emily, what can you tell us? So I'm live out here in El Cajon. We're in the parking lot of a taco shop, and you can see that we have, a, I'm going to guesstimate, about 100 people gathered out here, more and more showing up. Uh, people are angry, they're upset. I did speak with one witness out here who told me his version of what happened. He said that he saw uh, an African-American man about 30 years old who was not wearing a shirt, backing up in the parking lot with his hands up, nothing in his hands, and he says he saw the police officer standing about five feet away from that man in front of him, and he says they opened fire. One, one officer opened fire, shot the man five times, and he fell to the ground and was not moving. Police have a very different version of the story. People out here, they are angry. They feel that uh, this, there's a racial component to it. Um, here's what one of the people had to say. You don't think the police is gonna stop and ask? No, they're gonna kill him because they think he's a black man. He's not a man, that's a child. And look, that's a child. The crowd seems to have calmed down a little bit. I know that there did a prayer circle out here earlier. Um, we're just going to wait and see what happens. This still is a very active crime scene. It actually happened behind me about 100 feet. I don't even know if you could see the crime scene tape, but it appears more people are coming out here. People are not leaving the scene. I'm live in El Cajon. Back to you. All right, thank you, Emily. We've got 10 News reporter Steve Fiorina continuing our coverage. And Steve, have you learned any new information on why officers say they were forced to fire? Nothing exact yet because police continue an investigation. The people here, as uh, you see, demanding answers, but as Emily said, they are a little bit more calmed down right now. But still, they want to know exactly what happened. So we move over here and we can see close to two dozen police evidence markers over there. That is part of what they're doing in their investigation. They're also checking out a cell phone video that was turned over to them that they believe shows a good deal about this. They're also trying to see if there's any surveillance video in the area uh, that would indicate exactly what happened. A lot of these people here say that police should have had body cameras. Well, El Cajon bought them about a week ago, but they are not yet in the hands and on the bodies of those officers. They still have to be distributed, trained, and all of that. So the, the investigation will not go quite as smoothly as some in San Diego and other cities where the body cams are already there, but they are waiting for that to see what happens. All these people very concerned, especially in light of the uh, shooting last week in Charleston. They just advanced on him and asked him to take his hands out of his pockets. Mind you, the young man is mentally challenged, so I highly doubt he understood what was going on. And then they shot him five times. I don't think it takes five times to shoot somebody and take him down. I don't think you're supposed to be shooting a mentally challenged person. Again, that was not somebody who saw this, but somebody who came in, got caught up in the moment, talking to others who, there were a couple of people who did witness the incident, but many people, it's the, the uh, crowd uh, mentality, it grows with every telling, and so there's a lot of people, and again, demanding answers. Live in El Cajon, Steve Fury, 10 News. All right, Steve, Brian Shalonsky now in the 10 News Live Center. I want to show you exactly where Steve and Emily are standing, where the shooting took place. We know this is in El Cajon. This is at 833 Broadway. It's a shopping center up here, and it's uh, basically, see if I can take you in here to the map. It's basically uh, on the corner of Broadway and Mollison. This kind of gives you an overview shot. It's right around in this area. Officers have all of this taped off right now, as you saw, about two dozen evidence tags as they're gathering, trying to figure out what this is. The name of it is the Broadway Village Shopping Center. If you know the area, again, it's on the corner of Broadway and Mollison. And I want to show you another video as well that we're just getting in here to the Live Center. This kind of shows, we saw the crowd there, about 50, 60 people standing around Steve and Emily. Well, this is right after that shooting took place, and you see only a handful of people here at this time. Somebody actually shot this on a Facebook Live. You see that looks like an ambulance still there on the scene. You see police tape is up and, and a handful of officers walking around this parking lot. Again, this taken just minutes minutes after that shooting took place and now obviously the parking lot filled with people so we will keep those two reporters there on the scene working to gather more information guys for now back to you
All right, Brian. Joining us now is Kevin LaChapelle. He's a former police officer with the El Cajon Police Department. So, Kevin, in what situations would police be forced to shoot if there was no weapon? Well, we have to understand officers arrive and they're not sure what's going on. In this particular case, they do say this was a man with erratic behavior. And there's oftentimes individuals may be trying to have suicide by a police officer where they simulate and say that they have a firearm. They may be reaching in their waistband. There's so many things, so many different things, and that's really why it's so critical to allow the investigation to play out before any judgments are made. And Kevin, we're seeing scenes like this play out all over the country. In so many of these cases, it seems to be young black men. Yes. What do you see, what do you say to the public right now, just frustrated by this? They don't know why this continues to happen. Well, I think there's opportunity on the side of the police and there's opportunity on the side of the community. And I think what's critical now is how we work with each other because the police definitely, there is, there is definitely a need for reform across this country in policing strategies for the 21st century century because we're using techniques and things that were uh, you know from from decades ago uh, but the public also has to realize especially after viewing some of the uh, emotions out there at the scene here in El Cajon there's a way to handle yourself so that you can get good outcomes and right now to, to have violence or you know outrage is, is one thing but how they voice it is very very important all right Kevin LaChapelle thank you so much for your insight well, as soon as we get any new information, of course, on this investigation, we'll alert you through our 10 News mobile app. It is free to download it. Just search 10 News in your app store. All right, breaking news exclusive here. Barrel after barrel of explosive chemicals pulled from an East County home. The discovery leads investigators to nearly a dozen storage units filled with even more. 10 News reporter Vanessa Van Hefty live in Julian. Vanessa, the brilliant scientist behind this stolen stockpile took his plans to the grave. So dangerous, Itika, and this is one of eight storage facilities that he rented here. Take a look inside. This is what Hazmat found when they got here. They say all of this was enough to blow this place sky high. Even the chemical guys are shaking their heads going, this is crazy. For more than a decade, storage owner Fred Dornan had no idea what was lurking behind this door. I started opening units and was, yeah, I was shocked. More than 100 gallons of a toxic collection of chemicals. Ethers, nitriles, um, chloroform, just acids. There was just, it was so many different categories. That's the thing that was mind boggling. It belonged to Joseph Gilias. When he died of natural causes, his body was discovered here in his home, along with a stash of chemicals in the house and at these eight storage units here in Julian. He was a PhD chemist at the world-renowned Salk Institute in La Jolla. During his employment of 20 years, he was sneaking chemicals undetected. It's not just uh, liquids, it's solids, powders, things that if they hit the air, they could, you know, be dangerous, or if they get wet, they could be dangerous. So it was uh, pretty scary and shocking. No. Unit after unit revealed all kinds of lab equipment from glass beakers to old machines, most labeled Salk Institute. There was a chance. I mean, there was some of these chemicals, I guess, could be explosive. Hazmat teams knew this was no amateur operation. When Hazmat was here, they said there was a possibility they'd have to call the bomb squad. Dornan paid a private firm $35,000 to safely remove the chemicals that the loner chemist had big plans for. What do you think he was doing with all this stuff? Well, I knew he, I knew he, ha he had plans of starting his own, like a startup of some kind. He um, had talked to me about renting space to build a lab. One man's dreams nearly turned into another man's nightmare. I'm really thankful that nothing bad happened. All right, and we should mention that all of the chemicals have been safely contained in these large barrels here. There was no spillage. Now, we did reach out to the Salk Institute. It confirmed that, yes, everything that you see here was, in fact, stolen. Coming up at 7, we'll tell you why that response is really frustrating to the owner here, why he thinks that they should help foot some of the bill out here, $35,000. Reporting live from Julian, Vanessa Van Hefty, 10 News. All right, Vanessa, we'll see you then right now here in the 10 News Live Center. We have more breaking news to tell you about this alert just coming in from San Diego police. They have announced an arrest in the hit and run accident that nearly killed a Chargers intern in Pacific Beach. You may remember this story right there. That's J. Ron Irby. Police say that Omar Gutierrez was the one driving the car that hit Irby. Right now, got some video. This was from the scene that night. Irby is recovering right now at his home in the Bay Area after coming out of a coma a few weeks ago. Gutierrez was booked on three counts of assault with a deadly weapon and one count of destruction of evidence. Guys, back to you.
Thanks, Brian. We've got a breaking news update. A middle schooler's plot to shoot up an Oceanside school foiled. 10 News reporter Jessica Chen is at Lincoln Middle School tonight, where she just spoke with a local expert about warning signs that parents need to watch for. Police say the parents of this seventh grader had no idea their child was making these threats. Now, experts say some signs parents can look out for if their child has been feeling withdrawn from family and friends or if they start to view violence in a glamorized way. These are all signs something negative is going on with their child. According to the school district, this seventh grader threatened to shoot up Lincoln Middle School with a group of people in mind. He even had specific teachers and students he wanted to target. The district says they first got word of the students' intentions last Tuesday. They have notified everyone on that hit list. Right now, police say it appears that student did not have access to any weapons. Experts say parents are the first line of defense in preventing school tragedies. They say be involved, check their child's internet history, know what they're researching. Another red flag, a child suddenly showing less interest in normal activities is also a sign something is going on in their child's life. A safety and security meeting was held at the school here yesterday. Now the school district says they are working with the seventh grader, but he won't be returning back to school here. In Oceanside, Jessica Chen, 10 News. So important to get them resources. All right, well, one out of five California high schoolers will seriously think about ending their life this year. To fix this crisis, Governor Brown just made it the law for California schools grades 7 through 12 to have a suicide prevention policy in place by next fall. The goal is to identify students who are at risk and get them the help they need quickly. 10 News reached out to local school districts to find out what policies they may already have in place. So far, Grossmont, Sweetwater, and Poway have gotten back to us. They all say they will be updating their existing plans. All right, heavy orange flames, thick dark smoke tearing through the mountains here at Santa Cruz. Right now, 300 homes are in the Loma Fire's path. Families are being told to pack up and get out. And there was a huge mushroom cloud, which was pretty daunting and um, and then just watch it get bigger and bigger and bigger. That fire started yesterday afternoon and so far has burned more than 1500 acres. Firefighters say the heat is hindering their efforts. They are up against flames about 100 feet high. The fire only 5% contained. Crime alert, a new lead to help catch the men accused of sexual assault at Camp Pendleton. Navy investigators are looking for the person seen in this surveillance video here. They think he was with the two men just before the assault. It all happened at the popular Del Mar Beach at Camp Pendleton over Memorial Day weekend. There's a $1,000 reward to help find the men. Happening now, South Bay families are fed up with crime in their neighborhoods and they're taking their concerns to police. The Chula Vista Police Department is holding a community forum to talk about police videos, pot dispensaries and the homeless. But neighbors are expected to address a different topic. In the past month, they've posted videos of young men casing cars, vandalism, even an attempted abduction. They're calling for more officers on their streets. Only on 10 News, a string of car break-ins plaguing a local community. The one clue that could help crack the case, and police don't even want it. A man pepper sprayed inside McDonald's. What the attacker shouted about family values that has police investigating this as a hate crime. And our latest heat advisory just expired. Storms now moving through a couple of showers up in from the areas and our Doppler Live coming up. And now a look at what's ahead on World News Tonight with David Muir. Coming up, you'll see the massive and deadly home explosion. Authorities believe it was gas and arrest tonight. The death of a major league star and now the final text messages revealed. And the debate breaking a record. And will Donald Trump do the next two? What he's now saying next.
All right, we want to take you back out to the live scene. This is in El Cajon, where a few hours ago, a police officer says he was forced to shoot a black man at a strip mall there. Uh, we want to show you some evidence markers. You see all that down there? There are about two dozen evidence markers. We got shoes, uh, bullet casings, a lot of evidence that police are trying to keep track of. The crowd has been growing earlier today. It was just a few people, but you can imagine that crowd is growing. Just a few minutes ago, they were shooting hands up. Don't shoot. We're going to keep you posted on this with another live report coming up. Crime alert. Neighbors in Tierra Santa say this surveillance video could be the key to solving a string of car break-ins. 10 News reporter Michael Chen spoke to one victim who says she tried to hand over a clue to police, but they didn't want it. In a cozy neighborhood. Very quiet, very quiet. In Tierra Santa, along Avenida Circo, a discovery. Safe, very safe. That made Alicia Wood. You know, you worry about it, of course. Feel not so safe on Sunday around noon. Okay, so I was walking outside to get in my car and I approached it and I noticed that my door wasn't shut all the way. And so I opened it and I saw that my car had been disturbed. Inside Wood's Jeep Patriot. My glove box was open like this. A mess. There was some more items up there besides what you see now was all over the seat. She's not sure if the SUV had been locked. Instantly like knew somebody had been rummaging through my car, you know, kind of felt invaded, uncomfortable. Wood did not, however, notice anything missing. The culprit may not have taken anything, but he did leave something behind, right? On the front seat here was a flashlight. Surveillance video from a neighbor's house just before four that same morning shows a man possibly holding that flashlight as he tries to open an SUV door. And it makes you more aware of your surroundings. The image alarming neighbors and also giving them hope. According to CrimeMapping.com, the area hit by a string of car break-ins and thefts in the past few weeks. As for Wood's case. Because there wasn't anything taken, so they couldn't take a report. Wood says police did not want the flashlight, which he wrapped in plastic. They said throw it away. But now there is another clue. Hoping he gets caught. Wood believes could be the key to tracking down a thief. Michael Chen, 10 News. A San Diego police spokesperson says a report should have been taken in this type of case. We're told they are looking into her incident to see if procedure was followed. Right now, San Francisco police are looking for a group of men who pepper sprayed a gay couple on vacation. That couple was visiting from New York. They say five men in a van started yelling at them, calling them every name in the book. They went into a nearby McDonald's. The group followed them and then pepper sprayed them. And they're like, do you not understand that we have values here? We have family values here. here. There's children here. You don't belong here. Someone called 911, but the men took off. Detectives are investigating this as a hate crime. They're looking at surveillance video to try to track down those men. Weather Rate Certified, San Diego's most accurate forecast. This is 10 News Pinpoint Weather, sponsored by Bath Fitter. Well, yesterday, people were doing whatever they could to beat the heat, grabbing paper, yeah. doing whatever it took. And today, a little bit mm -hmm. cooler, but you're fighting with a little bit of rain now, actually. Yeah, a little bit of rain. Everybody really excited about that. And I think a lot of people are still fighting the heat today, Ariel, to be honest. But thankfully, it does get better. A live look outside. I was hoping the camera was actually looking over the water. And I think they're starting to move it because you can actually see how dark the skies are out there on the horizon. Let's see if they can move it just a little bit faster. I don't think it's going to happen. So we're going to just move on because there's plenty of activity out there. Area low pressure just to our south is actually lifting from Baja and as it continues moving north, we're getting the backside of it with the winds coming out of the north. This is the counterclockwise rotation around an area of low pressure. That's why the winds are now coming from the north and that's where the storms have been moving through as well. Most of the activity actually starting to just kind of die down. We had a couple of sprinkles in San Diego, also in the college area. And as we zoom in a little bit closer, you can see that there's still a few, a few spots that have a little bit of rain, but most of what we had near downtown and also in Coronado is now moving away. That's why the skies look so so uh, dark in Coronado. If you are at the hotel, maybe looking out there, that's exactly what you're looking at. You're looking at that cluster of rain that came through. There's still a chance for isolated showers this evening. Also possible thunderstorms until tomorrow afternoon. We'll keep it above average into the inland valleys on Thursday and then below normal in time for the weekend. So it does get better. Temperatures tonight will be mild. 63 Ramona, 68 Kearney Mesa.
67 in San Diego and then tomorrow we're still in the mid to upper 80s inland valleys, coastal areas anywhere from 75 to about 80 degrees. So I'm going to go with the highest number in our 10 news pinpoint 7 day forecast low 80s Wednesday, Thursday, 70s back on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You're actually going to see some clouds in the morning and even areas of patchy fog as we make our way inland temperatures into our inland valleys around 88 degrees Wednesday, 87 Thursday, and then finally back down to the 70s on Sunday next week. We'll keep it below average around 76 degrees on Monday. Wednesday, possible thunderstorms in the mountains. Otherwise, temperatures getting a lot more comfortable as we head into October. Finally, we start to see the temperatures cool enough to maybe wear a sweater in the morning. Yeah, shaking things up a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, thank Angelica. You. Well, we are about to reveal the latest high school football team to get the pro treatment from 10 News. Plus, Aztecs coach Rocky Long boasting today the one opponent his teams never lose against. Mic check, mic check, mic check. No IFB, one, two, three. Tonight's sports report is brought to you by Bass Fitter. Well, we'll start in college football where the San Diego State Aztecs are relishing their spot in both major polls. They're 19th in the Associated Press rankings and 24th in the coaches poll, even though the team had last weekend off. We moved up in the polls without playing a game. It's interesting how that works. So we had a good week last week. We always beat by. We're undefeated against by. I mean, they never beat us. We're happy about it, you know, finally get recognition, kind of moving up, but still got a mission to do, still going one week at a time until we're at the end of the season with an undefeated record and having a number at the end of our name. Despite their national ranking and undefeated record, the Aztecs won't be taking this week's opponent lightly. SDSU will play at South Alabama, a team that came into Qualcomm Stadium and upset the Aztecs 34-27 in overtime last season. Well, after stops at Modern Day Catholic, Valhalla, Madison, and Lincoln, it's time to reveal which school will be getting the pro treatment from 10 News this week as the first month of the high school football season wraps up. And our cameras will be headed out to Christian High School in El Cajon. This is a picture of the Patriots out at practice today. We're going to try to figure out just how this team continues to win despite regularly going up against schools with much larger student populations. They're already 4-0 this season. Plus, we'll take a look at a unique family legacy at the quarterback position. It all culminates on Friday night when we'll be out at Granite Hills High to watch Christian host a team visiting from the Bay Area. Patriots, welcome to the pro treatment. 
the Patriots are 4 and 0 here. They're 3 and 0 in the NFL. I guess it's just a good nickname to have. Got to love the Patriots, <laughs> all right. Well, we're staying on top of the situation in El Cajon where a black man was shot by police in a parking lot. Tonight at 7, we're going to have the very latest on the investigation and reaction from the scene. Police shoot a man in El Cajon. This is a live look at the crowd that is gathering there. This breaking story will continue to unfold well into the evening. We will have team coverage coming up on 10 News at 11 o'clock. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening for 10 News at 6 o'clock. We'll leave you with this beautiful shot of a beautiful San Diego sunset as we look toward downtown. And we'll see you at 10 News at 7. Thanks so much.